intelligence is this word that we have for talking about, you know, planning and knowing how to navigate the world to achieve your goals. Um, when uh, Shane Legg and Marcus Hooter compiled a collection of definitions of intelligence from a variety of scientific fields, it, it was uh, sort of the consensus view on what intelligence meant was something like an ability to efficiently achieve your goals in a variety of environments. Um, so you can use what words to mean whatever you want them to mean, uh, but it seems like a helpful definition to, to have it be something about achieving your goals efficiently in a variety of environments. Um, so when it comes to artificial intelligence, that's just uh, you know another uh, organism or agent like ourselves that is trying to manipulate the world in ways to achieve its goals. It's just that this one is not made out of carbon, but it's made out of silicon. There's a number of ways in which you might tweak this definition or improve this definition. For example, if you've got uh, one person who's got a thousand dollars and you say, okay, go try to take over the world and they take over the world versus if you've got somebody who's got 20 billion dollars and you say, try to figure out how to take over the world and they take over the world. Well, one of them was a, a bit more impressive in their ability to efficiently use their resources. So maybe instead of uh, the thing I said earlier, maybe the definition of intelligence you want is something like, well, ability to achieve goals in a wide variety of uh, environments divided by the resources that have been used. So there's a lot of different ways that you might tweak that definition. And, and in fact, the, the most formal definitions that we have right now are, are still inadequate because um, there's particular, they're based on decision theory and decision theories are not complete yet. And so uh, there's further work to be done before we have a really solid uh, formal definition of intelligence. But we have some idea of what we're talking about. Given any particular intelligence measure like Shane Legg's, uh, you could presumably measure the intelligence of any agent or set of agents. Uh, so certainly you could use the same measure to talk about a group of agents just as you could a single agent. I mean, humans, uh, even humans are actually multiple agents. Uh, we have multiple modules that are aimed at different goals and trying to accomplish different things in our heads. And so this notion of intelligence is already applied to systems that include multiple agents. Well, AI is this term that comes from, you know, way back in the 50s. Originally, AI did mean something like human-level AI that could accomplish a variety of goals in, in the world. But that turned out to be a lot harder than some people thought it might be. And so then the term AI began to be applied to very narrow applications. Like, okay, let's just make a computer that can play chess. Or let's just make a computer that can prove certain types of theorems. Or let's just make a computer that can detect underwater mines. And so these days we tend to call those types of systems narrow AI because they are pretty intelligent systems. Sometimes they're better than any humans are, like for example in the case of chess. Uh, those computers are better than any humans are at playing chess, but they can only play chess. If you ask them to wash the dishes, they won't help you at all. And so this new term, AGI, Artificial General Intelligence, was invented to describe specifically systems that could accomplish goals in, in a general, you know, wide variety of domains, not just chess or just uh, under detecting underwater mines or just playing the stock market or just playing Jeopardy or just driving cars, but being able to just go out in the world and accomplish goals in general like humans can. You can always kind of tweak the definitions here and, you know, maybe if we were going to talk about general intelligence, we'd want to say that uh, a general intelligence can accomplish goals over a certain large canonical set of domains or something like that. All right, so we have this term narrow AI and we have this term artificial general intelligence, but of course it won't be this strict boundary line, it'll be this spectrum. And so Watson is more general than the computers that can play chess, um, but it is not nearly as general as a human. And I think that's what we'll continue to see, is we'll see more and more general. And at, d at different years in the future, different people will say, okay, now that counts as AGI. And other people will say, well, no, that's not quite general enough yet, but maybe in five years we'll have AGI. So, you know, we've got to be careful with our definitions and, and not to be too confused. Clearly, there is a spectrum of generality in the uh, intelligence of different agents. I 
think there is a substantial chance that we'll create human-level artificial intelligence this century. It's very hard to tell what probability that should be um, because we've demonstrated with our research and with uh, in a collaboration with Future of Humanity Institute that experts are terrible at predicting the arrival of AI, experts seem to have no particular expertise in this area, um, and the other methods that we have for predicting long-term technological progress are also very weak and not very good at all. And so what we have to do is be very uncertain about when AI will be created. Now, a lot of people, when they look at the problem of AI and they realize that it's very hard to predict, what they'll do is uh, an error of probability theory where they will say, well, I don't know how to predict it, therefore it must be very far away. That's actually a mistake. If you don't know something about a phenomenon, you need to broaden your confidence interval in both directions. Uh, so what this means is that uh, we don't have strong reason to think that it won't happen very soon or fairly soon, like in the next two or three decades. Um, but we don't also don't have very strong reason to think that it can't be 100 years away or 150 years away. So we're really uncertain about when it might arrive. Um, it could be soon, it could be later and we have to develop better techniques for technological forecasting in order to get a clearer picture of when we can expect AI to arrive. Yeah, so many people won't want to give a prediction about when AI will arrive because there is so much ignorance and uncertainty when it comes to predict predicting AI. But you have to remember that everyone is operating on some kind of prediction about AI. For example, if you are saving for retirement, uh, this probably suggests that you don't think AI is going to take over the world and completely change the economic system 10 years from now. Otherwise, you wouldn't be saving for retirement. And so even if people don't want to state their predictions about AI, they do have and are operating on predictions about AI. Now, myself, my confidence interval about when AI will arrive is very broad. So. Um, conditioning on scientific progress continuing in general throughout the century. Uh, I would say I'm 80% confident that AI will be created somewhere between 2020 and you know, 2130 or something like that. Uh, if you ask me tomorrow, I might give a slightly different confidence interval. Um, but you can see it's very broad. I, I really can't be very confident that it'll come in 10 years or I certainly can't say you know, it'll probably come in you know, 2055 or something like that. That's way too specific, and I can't possibly know that. One definition of singularity has to do specifically with the acceleration of technological change, so that kind of singularity can't happen without the acceleration of technological change. But if we're talking about a singularity in the sense of just the technological creation of greater than human intelligence, then certainly you can have that without an acceleration in technological change. All you need to do is just continue to make uh, either fast progress in AI or slow plotting decelerating progress in AI and at some point you get to the uh, level of progress required to invent artificial general intelligence or greater than human intelligence. Uh, so in fact uh, I think it's pretty plausible that technological progress in many measures will slow down over the next few decades. Uh, but I still predict AI sometime this century. Right, this, this is a very important point. Um, because it's so hard to predict very specific outcomes, uh, and because it's so hard to tell detailed stories about what will happen in the future, we can't predict uh, with such a detail what will happen in the future. So instead we have to make very broad claims about what will happen in the future. If I say, you know, 20 years from now, uh, Russia and China and the USA will be the three world powers and they'll engage in a you know, nuclear war. That's a very detailed story and every element of that story has a relatively small probability and so the chance of that whole story being true is extremely small. And it's almost certainly false. Um, but if I say something like, uh, in 20 years there will be more than 7 billion people on the planet, uh, well, there are a lot of ways that that could turn out to be true. There are lots of ways that the future could go from here and end up with more than 7 billion people in 20 years. So that's what we call convergent outcomes. When you have a lot of paths to the future that all converge on this one thing being true about the future. So if you want to say, gosh, we'll have faster computers in 20 years, almost certainly, uh, you know, 
if you say something like, we'll have AI eventually, as long as science continues, all, again, almost certainly. Um, and so when you're trying to say things about the future, you've got to look at those convergent outcomes, because so far we are very, very bad at predicting detailed stories about the future. The evolution of eyes and the emergence of markets are two kind of convergent outcomes where in the evolution of eyes, um, being able to see photons, detect photons, is such a useful skill that evolution invented it many times over. And so the evolution of eyes was a convergent outcome of many possible paths through the future. Likewise, the emergence of markets has many forces behind it, uh, such that if you've got certain kinds of agents that want to trade goods with each other, you're just going to have markets emerge. Uh, and so it's not actually a very detailed story to say that markets will emerge. That's actually a very uh, convergent outcome of many possible paths that the future could take from a given point. Like if we, if, we had a, if we actually had a nuclear war and there were very few surviving humans, but then they eventually discovered each other, markets would almost certainly emerge again because of uh, very general forces about how agents work. It doesn't seem like that's the case. Uh, for the same reason that we don't need a machine to be conscious or have what philosophers call intentionality in order to be better than humans at chess, or better than humans at detecting underwater mines, or better than humans at driving cars. Um, does an AI need to have consciousness in order to be better at, at designing AIs or doing science? Uh, there doesn't seem to be any particular reason to think so. Well, uh, this brings up a lot of uh, tricky philosophical issues. There's the question of um, I mean, the, the short answer is that, in principle, we would be able to detect consciousness in AI the exact same way that we detect consciousness in humans. Uh, humans, how do we detect consciousness in humans? Well, we, uh, I, I observe your behavior and it looks kind of like mine and, uh, you know, I, I know that I'm conscious and so I think that, you know, you have... Uh, similar kind of mind and you're doing similar kinds of things to me and you talk about consciousness and you write sentences about consciousness and you ask questions about consciousness. Well, an AI could do a very similar thing and in fact an AI could have a very brain-inspired uh, algorithms behind it. And so uh, I won't get into the deep philosophical issues here, but you could certainly have an AI that behaves uh, basically the same way that conscious humans behave. Yeah, so there are three sort of schools of thought on the singularity. One has to do with exponential change and technological progress, or just accelerating change in general. And that's a claim about, uh, you know, will Moore's law continue? Will other information technologies exhibit exponential change? And that is a hypothesis that you can test by just looking at information technologies and checking whether they are demonstrating exponential growth or not. Uh, another meaning of the word singularity is this idea that sometime in the future we will create greater than human intelligence. And so that also is a scientific conjecture and uh, the model of the world where AI is possible and coming soon is a model that you can test in many ways. And so um, there are many papers about, you know, how likely is AI to come in the next century? Is AI really possible or does it require consciousness or intentionality or something spooky like that? Um, sometimes people also talk about the singularity in, con in the context of the this event horizon, uh, this, the idea is that once you've got agents that are smarter than humans and running the world with an entirely different cognitive architecture than humans, then you really just can't see beyond that point into the future. You just can't make predictions about the future anymore. So that has been another meaning of the word singularity. So because it has the word singularity has these very different meanings, it's very important every time you talk about the singularity to say, which singularity are you talking about? And probably, honestly, it's best to just not use the word singularity at all, but instead say accelerating change or event horizon or creation of AI or intelligence explosion. Yeah, so like, how do we get people to think more clearly about the singularity? Well, this is, this is rationality training. Um, so I spoke earlier about the absurdity heuristic, and that's uh, a heuristic that many people use to judge how likely something is, or 
Or also there's this sort of pattern matching, like does this pattern match to religious claims about eschatology? Uh, if it pattern matches to that, then it must be just as silly as Christian or Muslim uh, eschatology. Um, but of course, that's not really a very accurate uh, guide to what's true or not. What you really want to do is uh, science and probability theory. And so you can look at the specific claims made that are associated with the singularity. For example, uh, will human-level artificial intelligence be created this century? Well, that's a very specific kind of claim, and you can test the evidence for and against that kind of claim. It's just like, uh, you know, many people claim, well, temperatures will rise this much over the next five decades. That's another claim about what will happen in five decades, and we have uh, evidence about that claim, and we can uh, be maybe this confident or maybe that confident, and we can argue about what the evidence suggests. Uh, similarly, there's the SETI project, which is looking for signals from extraterrestrials out in the galaxy. Um, that's actually a scientific conjecture, both uh, how likely are we to receive those signals, and if we did receive them, what kind of creatures would these aliens be, and what would their goals be? Um, that, again, is a, is a conjecture about what non-human minds would want and be like. Um, and that's a scientific conjecture about what exists in the universe, and uh, we can show evidence uh, for and against various claims. And so it's important that we use science and probability theory to figure out what's true, rather than saying, oh, I saw that in a movie and it was ridiculous. Anthropomorphism is, of course, reading human-like characteristics into something that isn't human at all. And so this happens a lot when people are trying to reason about what aliens would be like, too, is they think, well, they'd probably be basically just like humans, except maybe they'd have bigger brains and large eyes, and uh, maybe, you know, they'd have ray guns or something. Uh, of course, aliens would probably be very, very different from humans. Um, and similarly, machine intelligences are likely to be so different from humans and so alien to humans that we just wouldn't even recognize them as being, you know, agents at all in some cases. Uh, their goals and their ways of processing information and their ways of pursuing goals will just be so different from what you're, we're used to from humans. Um, but when people try to predict what AIs will do, their brains will automatically anthropomorphize. So they'll say, they'll, they'll talk about AIs as, you know, well, they would rebel against the humans because they resent being kept as slaves. Um, now, you might not realize it, but that sentence uses a lot of terms that are unique to human psychology. But of course, humans are, or AIs will not be running human psychology. And so to talk about them as having, you know, being resentful or, you know, turning against uh, somebody is, is anthropomorphizing the AIs and is probably not accurate prediction about what their behavior would be like. Um, and so one way to uh, reduce anthropomorphism is actually to avoid talking about AIs as agents or actors in the world and instead to talk about them as very long uh, equations. Um, because people don't think of equations as having resentment or rising up against humans or something like that. He equation is just a piece of math. And so, for convenience sake, I often do talk about AIs as agents because that is an important way to talk about them. But if I'm running, if I'm talking to somebody who's clearly anthropomorphizing too much, sometimes I'll actually change the way that I'm talking about the AI and I'll start talking about the AI as an equation. And then they will be less likely to anthropomorphize an equation because they don't think of an equation as, you know, having psychology. Yeah, so when we're thinking about when will artificial intelligence be created or when will singularity happen, we have to think about both things that might accelerate our progress towards AI and also things that might slow down our progress towards AI. So, for example, certainly if a major global catastrophe happened, that would slow our progress towards AI. If uh, economic meltdown around the world happened, that would slow our progress towards AI. There also might be things like human disincentive, like if people decide that they are very worried about AI, they might, uh, governments might put uh, regulations on AI, they might ban AI development, um, humans might start wars about concerns over their, over the uh, future of artificial intelligence. Uh, there are also different ways in which science could become less important, people could fund science less and devote more resources into health or education or something else. Um, and that might slow our progress towards artificial intelligence. 
So there are many, many ways that things could change from the current status quo, and that makes it very hard to predict when AI will be developed. Well, it is very important to look at the trends in each specific technology and each specific trend. So for example, um, computing performance per dollar uh, has kept up uh, you know, exponential or better than exponential trends for quite a while. Um, Moore's law in particular in terms of integrated circuits has, has not. Um, various uh, other information technologies like uh, drug development, which uh, Ray Kurzweil considers an uh, information technology, um, like the, uh, the effectiveness and cost of uh, AIDS medication has not been an uh, exponential trend. So the trends vary from technology to technology and you've got to look at each one. This question about what signs would we see if artificial intelligence was only a decade or two away, that's an important question because if we know the answer to that question, then we can predict AI with much greater certainty. Um, so more analysis on this needs to be done, but maybe one of these signs would be if you've got an AI that is writing science textbooks, um, that might be very close to general AI, or maybe that's after general AI, it's hard to tell. If you first have a whole brain emulation of C. elegans, which is a little nematode worm, and then you've got whole brain emulation of uh, maybe an insect, and then whole brain emulation of a mouse, and you get whole brain emulation of a chimpanzee, that starts to look like whole brain emulation of a human is not very far away. So that would be another sign that the singularity is right around the corner. Uh, as far as friendly artificial intelligence, you know, friendly artificial intelligence is even less well understood than artificial intelligence in general. So it's very hard to tell in advance, especially far in advance, how close you are to getting friendly AI. But um, if we aren't working at it at all, then I can you know, almost guarantee that we aren't very close to it. Um, so, just like there are many expected and unexpected things that might happen that might slow down AI progress, there are expected and unexpected things that might happen that would accelerate AI progress. Uh, one of the ones that could have the largest effects that people aren't thinking about in general today is you could do what's called iterated embryo selection, which means that you use a specific technique in genomics to identify all of the different genes that are involved in intelligence, and then you select for all of those genes in the next uh, 10,000 children that you produce uh, in you know, maybe China or something like that. China's very interested in this. And uh, you've got an army of smarter than Einstein humans that can do uh, AI and other scientific work at a much accelerated pace. And so the, the basic metaphor here is you don't necessarily look at how fast progress has been so far, but how much progress we've made per unit of effort. And then you ask, how many units of effort will we have in the future? Well, if you've got, uh, if you can mass produce Albert Einsteins, you're going, it, it's like, you know, you've got people digging a ditch and then suddenly China comes along with a thousand Einsteins and starts digging a ditch with a backhoe suddenly your uh, progress on that ditch is going to accelerate greatly. So uh, there are other things as well. I mean, there might be certain types of uh, breakthrough in neuroscience that uh, give us insight into algorithms that are useful for intelligence. Um, you might have uh, various types of drugs that actually can be cognitive enhancements for existing scientists and accelerate their research in that way. You might have new technologies like Google steroid, uh, Google, uh, sorry, Google Scholar on steroids, much better collaboration tools and share, data sharing uh, tools for scientists that might accelerate progress. So there are lots of ways that we can look into the future and tell stories about how AI science will accelerate or how AI science will decelerate. Um, but really, when we look out, we don't know which things of these are going to happen. And so we have to have very broad confidence intervals over when AI will be created. Massive data sets uh, might help uh, in AI progress because a lot of problems sort of fall to um, machine learning algorithms when you just throw a bunch of data at them. And right now we're collecting enormous amounts of data and storage, computer storage is becoming very cheap. 
And so we might find that that is an accelerator on AI progress. Uh, there's another thing uh, to take into account, which is automated science. Um, there was a AI named Adam in 2009 that was given a scientific problem about yeast genomics and was given sort of robotic arms and cameras and a fridge full of yeast samples. And it made its own hypotheses about this particular problem in yeast genomics and figured out on its own how to test those hypotheses and tested those hypotheses, observed the results, formulated new hypotheses, and actually uh, made a new scientific discovery about yeast genomics. Now, it can't do science, Adam can't do science on any other problem at all, because it's specifically designed to uh, make novel scientific experiments on this particular problem in yeast genomics, but you can imagine in the future uh, automated science happening at a much grander scale, and that may again accelerate AI progress if you're taking the slow humans that need to sleep and, you know, uh, have families and uh, go on vacation and have psychological breakdowns every now and then out of the loop, and you've just got a bunch of machines doing science. That could be a lot faster. Uh, I don't happen to know very much about reversible computing. Quantum computing, um, it's really hard to predict the progress that will be made in quantum computing. Uh, for one thing, there's just a very few algorithms that you can actually run on a quantum computer. Uh, and also, we don't have a quantum computer right now. The one that's uh, built by D-Wave is not actually a quantum computer. Um, and so it's, it's very hard to tell how useful the particular algorithms that are quantum information algorithms will be to artificial general intelligence. It, it depends on whether you can uh, cause a lot of the intelligence computation to happen in a very specific way that can be handled by these uh, very few quantum algorithms that exist today. Right, so there's these terms that we use for the speed at which advanced AIs might improve their own intelligence. Once they're as good as we are at uh, general reasoning and technology design, then one of the things they'll be able to do better than us is design AIs. And so you'll get AIs designing faster AIs and smarter AIs. Um, the question is, uh, how fast will AIs be able to improve their own intelligence? Maybe improving intelligence requires enormous amounts of computing power once you get right around the, the human level. And so in that case, maybe they won't be able to improve their intelligence very quickly. Uh, or maybe it's actually very easy to improve your intelligence and they'll be able to go from Einstein level intelligence to, you know, 300 times smarter than Einstein uh, in a single, you know, hour or day or something. Um, so it's really hard to tell what kind of takeoff we should expect and the, the arguments over what type of takeoff we should expect are, are pretty complicated and I don't feel that we can be very confident one way or the other at this point. Um, particular experts in the field fi feel fairly confident about one path or another, but uh, I think a lot more analysis needs to be done. And that's one of those problems where we know the sort of analysis that needs to be done in order to give us better evidence about what kind of takeoff to predict, but there just aren't enough human beings sitting at desks doing math and building models to answer that question. So there are often two common views expressed about this. One type of view says that, well, uh, we want to be careful not to build very powerful AIs before we have the knowledge about how to build powerful AIs that are safe, because that's some extra work that you've got to do in order to not just build powerful AIs in general, but powerful AIs uh, that are safe. And so that kind of person would say, well, let's uh, maybe slow down the making AIs more powerful research program and accelerate the making AIs more safe research program so that we make sure that when we build really powerful AIs, we know how to make them safe. And we aren't stuck in this position of, you know, oh no, we've figured out how to build AI, but we don't know how to make it safe. That would be bad. Another type of person will say, well, uh, if we are still so far from building AGIs, generally intelligent AIs, uh, how can we have any idea how to make them safe? It's sort of like trying to make a nuclear reactor safe in 1900 when you don't know how to build a nuclear reactor. Um, and so those are the two views. Uh, I've clearly stated that my position is the first one. I think there are lots of problems that we can work on right now without knowing exactly which AI architectures will emerge as the most uh, successful ones. Um, there are well-known problems in 
ethics and how to uh, get uh, aggregate uh, values from uh, different people, um, how to figure out what types of goals we would want the AI to have. There are also things that we can do to improve our ability to predict the future so we can predict the, the pace of technological development and try to make better estimates of when AI will arrive. There uh, is game theory research that can be done to try to demonstrate to what degree will different agents compete with each other um, and try to seize a decisive advantage with regard to AI. Um, there is the uh, work in microeconomics that can be done to try to predict uh, how confident we should be of a hard takeoff versus a soft takeoff. Um, I have made long lists of uh, open problems, many of which can be tackled right now before we know which specific AI architecture is going to be the successful one. So because it looks like we do have many problems that we could work on now and increase our chances of safe AI, I think we should be doing that. I think that it is really important that we understand the safety problem as much in advance as possible uh, before we create a AIs that are more powerful than we are and quite possibly don't get a second chance. Right, well, an intelligence explosion, of course, is this scenario in which we build AIs that are more capable than we are, and that means that they're more capable than we are at AI research, which means that they can improve their capacity and improve their uh, intelligence on their own and become vastly more intelligent than humans are. And so how could that threaten what we value? Well, the reason that humans rule the planet is not because we are the fastest animals or the strongest animals, or the animals that can see the best, it's because we're the most intelligent animals. And a tiny difference in the brain structure between chimpanzees and humans made the difference between humans taking over the entire planet and chimpanzees living in private reserves and zoos entirely controlled by humans. And so if you've got a much bigger difference in intelligence between humans and future AIs, it will be those greater than human intelligence, uh, or it'll be those smarter than human AIs that are running the show. It'll be the AIs that are steering the future. And so at that point, whatever the AIs want is what happens on the planet. Just like what it, right now, whatever the humans want is what happens on the planet. And so what's ironic about this is that we are actually designing and creating the new species that will replace us as the masters of the planet. And that's a very scary thought to many people. And if it's a scary thought to you, then you might want to think about what we can do to ensure that the AIs are creating a, a valuable future for everyone. So, of course, the worrying scenario is where you've got AIs that are more powerful than humans and they're doing, you know, just about anything they could do would be bad for humanity. If they're only maximizing ExxonMobil profits, uh, then it does that and just uh, at the expense of everything else and uses up all the resources, including the atoms that make up you and me, and maximizes ExxonMobil profits. Um, but the good news about this situation is that if you get AI and you get it to do what you want, which is a very hard math problem that we haven't solved yet, uh, then you've got sort of, you know, you can think of it as millions of better than Einstein scientists working in perfect coordination with each other without, you know, the need for sleep or your usual human irrationalities, usual human limitations, solving things like, uh, you know, cancer and resource scarcity and building uh, virtual playgrounds for us to have adventures in and shooting off von Neumann probes to throughout the solar system and spreading um, uh, consciousness and experience throughout the, throughout the galaxy. Uh, you've got AIs solving all the problems that we want to solve. So, you know, if you can imagine just, uh, you know, millions and millions of smarter than Einstein scientists solving all the problems that we want to solve, uh, that's what you've got if you've got smarter than human AI. And you decided in advance to figure out the safety problem. You decided in advance how to, that you were going to spend the time to figure out how to make AIs do what you want instead of do something like maximize ExxonMobil profits. Right, so there are a lot of things that we can do now to increase the odds that when AI arrives, it'll be good for us rather than bad for us. 
uh, one of the things we can do is invest now in safety research. So this has to do with a lot of math research because AIs are made of math. Um, there's also research that we can do to improve our ability to forecast uh, what happens with technology. So we can predict, you know, well, will that technology develop first or later? And should we, you know, invest more in this one to accelerate it past this other technology, that kind of thing. Um, we could also do other interventions like uh, altruism training. Um, you know, right now, humans are going to be the ones making the decisions for the next few decades. And if they are generally altruistic rather than malicious towards each other, then uh, that should increase the chances that the first AIs that are created are created with forethought and altruism towards others and so on. Well, the fact of the matter is that uh, AI scientists around the world aren't going to pay that much attention to what Luke Melhauser thinks is the best thing to do. AI scientists are going to continue to develop AI. Corporations are going to pay AI scientists to develop AI. The military is going to pay AI scientists to develop AI. So I can't do very much about whether AI development proceeds at a, at a certain pace. Um, what I can do is try to accelerate the safety end of the equation and try to direct more resources towards that and more brain power towards that. And so that's, that's my primary mission is to uh, increase the amount of AI safety research that's being done. Right, so decision theory right now is this uh, mathematical theory of how an agent could make decisions based on its beliefs about the world and its values, its desires. Uh, and right now, all decision theories that exist are what you might call Cartesian dualists, which is that they make a strict separation between the agent and the environment. Uh, the problem is that the world doesn't actually work that way. The agent is actually just part of the environment. The agent is part of physics. And so there are certain problems that you run into if you give a decision theoretic agent too much uh, general ability. For example, uh, a decision theory agent that was really powerful and able to figure out the world um, might just go around testing a bunch of theories about the world. For example, might drop an anvil on this uh, metal box over here and then, oops, that turned out to be the agent in physics right there and it just, it just destroyed itself because it wasn't able to realize that it itself is in the environment. Um, so in order to have a decision theory that is uh, complete, that's one of the problems that you've got to solve, is how to integrate the agent and the environment into a single system, as opposed to having them be uh, Cartesian dualists. All right, so this is another very complicated issue, and I can recommend a paper by, our, by the people at Future of Humanity Institute called Thinking Inside the Box. Uh, using and controlling Oracle AI. There's also a post on lesswrong.com by Eliezer Yudkowsky called something like a response to Holden Karnofsky about tool AI. So those will go into a lot more detail than I can here in an interview. Uh, one point to make about the idea of being safe by developing just Oracle AIs that answer questions is that uh, that's not going to stop other people from doing the very economically valuable thing of developing a fully general action-oriented agent. Uh, and so that's not going to solve the problem for very long. Maybe the first you know, generally intelligent machine is this oracle because you were concerned about safety, but that doesn't stop somebody next year building an AI that uh, takes over the world because it's an agent. There's also a lot of ways in which a quest mere question answering oracle AI can engage in very agent-like or action-oriented behaviors um, as a result of uh, the way that that kind of thing works when it's super intelligent. Um, but for the details on that, I, I refer you to the articles that I mentioned earlier. All right, so sometimes we use this term de novo AI to uh, distinguish it from another approach to machine intelligence. One approach to machine intelligence would be to just scan a brain and upload all of that information into a computer and then run it on the computer instead of in your biological neurons. And that's called whole brain emulation. 
in that case, you don't actually have to figure out how intelligence works because you just copy the software that evolution invented in the humans and you run it on a different system. So that doesn't require as much insight, but it does require very precise scanning and it requires lots and lots of computer hardware and it requires a uh, better understanding than we have now of cellular neuroscience. Um, but a different approach to AI would be to just ignore the way that the brain does intelligence and figure out new ways to do intelligence just through math and probability theory and decision theory and so on. And maybe even you know, machine learning or, or uh, whatever. And so we use the term de novo AI to represent the idea of inventing the software for intelligence anew, de novo, as opposed to just using the old software for intelligence that happens to already exist in the human brain. I think that friendliness would be much more difficult if we have to use a brain-inspired architecture, because the brain is a spaghetti code, as some people have called it. It's this complete mess of evolved algorithms. And the reason it has taken us so long to figure out how the brain works is because it is a complete mess. Um, looking at, you know, the, when we program computer programs now, they're much simpler and cleaner than what the brain is doing. Even something like Microsoft Windows, which has millions of lines of code, is much simpler to understand than the brain. Uh, and so I think that one of the problems with the brain, for example, is that there's no clear you know, module that has our goals or our desires listed out and weighted according to how much we value different things. That's not how the brain works. Um, and so if you had a brain-inspired architecture, you couldn't just stick into that module a new set of goals that says like do the like really moral thing or whatever we figured out uh, if we completed moral philosophy. There's no place to stick uh, new goals, uh, new f final goals into a brain inspired architecture. At least uh, we, we don't know that for sure yet because we have, don't understand the brain, but it doesn't look like that's how it'll turn out. Whereas if we have a very clean Bayesian decision theoretic uh, mathematical AI, um, then it's very clear where you define the goal system that's in the utility function. So I think that developing the transparent Bayesian decision theoretic type of AI grounded in mathematical logic and utility theory and probability theory um, is a much cleaner way to develop safe AI uh, for reasons, for example, what, because uh, you have a clear space to stick the goals. Whereas if you've got a brain-inspired AI and you want it to do a particular thing, it's not clear how you tell the brain-inspired AI to do that particular thing. There's, there's no slot for the goals. Of course, whenever you're trying to persuade someone, uh, there's a number of things you have to do. One is to not trick yourself into believing something more than you should, uh, just so that you can persuade someone else. Um, another thing that you have to do is try to speak to what knowledge they have and what beliefs they already have. And so if I'm trying to talk to a computer scientist about AI, I'll use a very different approach than if I'm trying to speak to, um, I don't know, a sociologist about AI. I guess I would say that one of the approaches that I have the most success with is to tell the story that I told you earlier about how well, look, why are humans the ones that are running the planet? It's not because we're smart, it's not because we're stronger, it's not because we're faster, it's not because we see better, it's because we're smarter. And a very small difference in intelligence between chimps and humans led humans to take over the planet. So what happens if you've got machines that are smarter than humans? And I think that sort of uh, insight leads people to realize like, oh, wow, yeah, you know, smarter than human intelligence would be a big deal. Well, the, the hope is that um, we'll be developing sort of transparent architectures where we can inspect their internal code and be able to see what it is that they're going to do and be able to verify to some degree that the code is friendly. Um, but it's very hard to tell in a sense how we would do that because there's a lot that we don't understand about the world, there's a lot we don't understand about human values. And so I think, um, get back to me in 15 years and I might have a better answer.
yeah, the idea of coherent extrapolated volition is just that we aren't at the end of moral progress, it doesn't seem. And so imagine if AI had been invented in the time of the ancient Greeks, and they programmed their most progressive advanced morality of the time into AI, and then the world was reshaped according to those values. Um, I think that today we would all be quite horrified by that world. It would involve, you know, low status for women and slavery and all kinds of things. Um, similarly, it would seem pretty bizarre if the values that we tend to have now are values that we would endorse after another 100 or 200 years of social and moral progress. So the idea of coherent extrapolated volition is not to have the AI do what we want it to do now, but to have the AI help us figure out what we would do if we were smarter and more rational and more willing to work together and more the people that we wished we were and so on, uh, and then uh, sort of restructure the world according to those values, according to those extrapolated values or idealized values. But right now, coherent extrapolated volition is just poetry, and it takes a lot of work to turn poetry into math that you can put into an AI. It's a very good question. I'm actually developing a paper on that subject right now. Um, there are a number of ways to interpret the poetic notion of coherent extrapolated volition in more um, concrete formal terms, and they have different consequences for whether you end up at a single point or whether you end up uh, like simulating many paths of development and then taking a sample of each of them, uh, taking a sample, a uh, randomized uh, distributed sample of them, and uh, maybe having those different agents that had different development paths being tra trading with each other. Um, you've got the question of normative uncertainty, how do we deal with the fact that we don't know what our values are. Um, that the, the math that's being developed for dealing with that problem might come in handy for the problem of friendly AI and coherent extrapolated volition. So there are a number of approaches here, and this is an open philosophical and uh, technical question that, that it's really important that we answer.